Welcome to A Walk in the Park with Gil, where every other week I invite fascinating people to talk about cities. Sometimes it's about parks, others about walking, riding bicycles, using public transit, or children and others in cities, public health, the environment, and much more. My name is Gil Penalosa, and I was born in Bogota, Colombia, where as commissioner, I led the design and construction of over 200 parks and took a small program of open streets called Ciclovia and turned it into the world's largest pop-up park with 121 kilometers, 76 miles of car-free streets where people of all ages and backgrounds enjoy the presence of each other as equals. 17 years ago, I created 880 Cities, a non-profit organization based in Toronto, Canada, where I live. Before the pandemic, I had worked in 345 cities in all continents, which is why my master classes now are called Gill in 345 cities. This bi-weekly webinar is a way of giving back, always free. Invite anyone who cares about cities and people to join us. Your comments and suggestions are always welcome. Okay, now we have Jenny and Melissa. Two amazing women, two amazing people that are living around the world in knowledge about how to create restorative cities and how to create power prescriptions and things that are doable. So we're going to start with uh, Jenny Rowe, professor, and I want each one of you, when you start, please tell us a little bit about yourselves. And to the participants, remember, before the presentations, use chat as much as possible. During the presentations, please do not use the chat because people get distracted. As soon as the presentations end, once again, use the chat. The Q&A is open at all times. So feel free to use the Q&A at all times. Uh, so Jenny, welcome. Let's start with you. And then we're gonna go to Dr. Melissa Lem. Well, thank you, Gil. It's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon. It's afternoon in Scotland where I'm talking to you from and to also to join Dr. Lem um, in talking about nature and cities. Uh, so I'm Jenny Rowe. I live between Edinburgh and Charlottesville. Um, I teach at the University of Virginia and I'm an environmental psychologist and I'm really interested and in research how people interact with their environments. And mostly my research is focused on interactions with parks and urban green space. And that's what I'm talking to you about today. Um, and I'm here now in Edinburgh for the summer, um, through the summer recess. Um, I did promise I would talk about Edinburgh. I will be talking about some of my research in Scotland. I'll also be pulling in a, a few pieces from the US as well, just to make sure we're up to date and current. So I'm gonna share the screen now. I hope that you can all see this. I'm going to start the slideshow now. And this is Edinburgh. Uh, Jan Gell, I'm sure many of you have heard of Jan Gell, Copenhagen Danish architect described the city of Edinburgh as one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Um, I tend to agree with that. It has got its problems, but um, you can see in this slide, it has ac access to water, it has the sea, it has access to green space, it has seven hills. Um, here is one of them, Salisbury Crags. I focus as an environmental psychologist largely on the relationship between cities and people's mental health. Uh, why do I do that? Well, cities are associated with higher rates of mental health problems. I'll let you read those statistics in the slide. I would also say that there is an urban advantage in living to cities and that it gives us greater access to unemployment opportunities, to recreational facilities, to healthcare facilities. But since COVID, there's been really um, an urgency in the need to think more creatively about how we design our cities to address mental health issues, um, particularly those sort of what's been called the tsunami of mental health problems that are hitting us in this what I call quasi kind of COVID period. We're not out of COVID. Uh, different parts of the world are in different sort of spaces here in the UK masks mandates are off um, but you know in China COVID is rising so we're not out of the woods yet and so how can we use our cities more creatively to help address this issue 
Um, before I get into some of those um, solutions and ideas, I'm going to talk a little bit about what mental health is. Um, I'm just going to read um, the World Health Organization definition of mental health. They define mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully and able to make a contribution to her or his community. So that includes our emotional state, but much more than our emotional state about how well we're functioning cognitively, the quality of our social relationships, the variety of our interests, and how happy and satisfied we are with our lives. I joined forces with Layla McKay in 2018. Layla is a psychiatrist and now heads up um, the policy uh, direction for NHS Confederation. And we both felt in 2018 that mental health had been really left off the urban agenda. I think cities um, around the world um, are doing a very good job, some of them, of designing the urban environment for active living in terms of walkability, in terms of increasing access for cycling and other forms of public transit. But we both felt that, that, that mental health needed a higher place in terms of urban design. So pre-COVID, we set forth and we reviewed the evidence. We reviewed thousands of studies in restorative environment research which show that certain settings, particularly nature settings, foster recovery from fatigue, from depression, from stress and anxiety. Um, there's a very strong theoretical basis to the idea of restorative environments that um, spawn from Kaplan and Kaplan and Roger Ulrich, a Swede, that states a restorative environment restores depleted psychological resources. All of us suffer through our everyday work life um, from depletion in those resources. And a restorative environment can make us more mentally alert, less stressed, it improves our mood. There's also evidence to show these environments improve altruism, they foster social health, build social capital. And natural environments are particularly well endowed with these restorative properties. Now, these are the four psychological attributes of any restorative environment. They are particularly prevalent in nature, all right? So that sense of being away that we all recognize when we step out into nature, be it a pocket park like Paley Park in New York or a much larger expansive park in a city. Alongside being away is a closely aligned attribute of extent. Extent is that sense of being up and out of your world, looking across to the horizon, being transported somewhere else. Um, it's a feeling we get when we climb up and look out of a city. Park Güell in Barcelona is a good example of that. Here we have Medellin and a view up and out of a city. Nature is particularly well endowed with the quality of fascination and curiosity. Uh, we recognize that in, 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 in the fractal patterns that nature produces, but also fascination can be delivered using hard built environment attributes. And then the fourth is compatibility. It makes sense that any environment to help our mental well-being has to deliver um, what we need for, from that environment. Um, so Leila and I have conceptualized the green and the blue city, which I'll be talking about in more detail, within a wider framework, which has seven pillars. And they, these, are, these pillars share interactions. Um, green cities are very much um, related to inclusive cities. Park access needs to be inclusive. Likewise, access to water needs to be inclusive. Um, and other pillars that are interrelated to these themes are the playable, the active, the neighborly, and the sensory city. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about the green city now. Um, so what Leila and I did was review the evidence, and there's a huge amount of evidence relating to the benefits of green cities and urban parks. 
we have put some of the, the, the kind of pathways into very simple interactive diagrams. Um, public health epidemiologists, super smart people generate very complex diagrams about these pathways. This is a very simplified version of it. But some of the mechanisms which support our relationship with nature include the type of contacts um, and the type of the nature setting. Is it a park? Is it a forest? Is it a balcony? And then some of the mechanisms by which this process works include psychological mechanisms through attention restoration and stress reduction, biochemical mechanisms. When we're outdoors in parks, we have increased exposure to sunlight and increased um, production of vitamin D, which supports our immune function and so on. There isn't time to go each through each of these diagrams. Um, uh, individually, but just to give you a flavor for what we're trying to do here is explain some of the individual um, moderators uh, of these pathways and some of the societal and environmental impacts too. This is a key diagram. Um, each chapter in the, sh the book shares the same uh, diagrammatic formats. So here's the host of benefits that green cities bring. And I know that Dr. Lim is gonna be talking about some research relating to these benefits. And I'm also gonna be flagging some of my own research up in relation to the mental health benefits. Um, I will let you scan those very quickly in this slide rather than going into each one in detail, but hugely well evidenced. And then we've taken the evidence and we have tried to break it down into really simple design principles, both at a neighborhood scale and at a city scale. Um, and the reason we've done this is because people who govern for our environments, people in urban planning, people in public health, they need evidence, they need robust scientific evidence, but they also need the principles to be really easily translated. I would say the single most important thing about a green city is the connection between green spaces. And we might as well include blue into that equation too. Connection. So you can walk to work through street lined tree, um, tree lined streets, my apologies, but also into pocket parks, into bigger parks to get to your destination. So connectivity. Um, it's super important, as is access to these facilities. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly now about the Blue City. This is Sheffield, which has one of the few um, Blue City master plans I'm aware of, certainly in the UK. Uh, they use water on a grand scale to uh, screen noise and to welcome people to their city. Um, so the same kind of format for Blue City Effects. This is the canal side in Edinburgh, a great uh, waterway that provides active living uh, transit for cyclists, walkers, um, and recreational facilities too, in terms of access to the water. So a very similar type of diagram here, showing those pathways between access to water and um, health and men mental health and well-being. And this is Portobello Beach. Portobello is a village in Edinburgh, um, is where I spend a lot of time um, doing some wild swimming. Very similar benefits in relation to access to water and mental health benefits, but not as well evidenced as the green city benefits I've just flagged. One thing I would say about water is it's one of the most restorative attributes in our environment. It's dynamic. The way that water flows over different surface textures, the way that light hits it, the sound that it makes as it falls over different surface textures increases its fascination components. So going back to that um, earlier slide showing the cycle logical attributes of these restorative environments, fascination and curiosity amongst water settings is really super high. And same thing here, we have um, blue cities envisaged at a neighborhood scale and at a city scale, um, integrating features such as sustainable street drainage systems, which also help increase biodiversity and provide a venue for nature and green space too. 
All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about my own research in Scotland um, and what I'm bringing to that research, research piece. So I'm a former landscape architect. I retrained in psychology and behavioral science. I'm blending those two disciplines alongside um, earlier studies in anthropology and humanities. And now the piece I'm bringing to this is neuroscience and the advancement of um, what I'm calling mobile neuro kind of technological sensors that help us see what's happening with people's body physiology as they move through space. What I'm interested in is what makes us well. The way I look at that in terms of the environment is quite often between diametrically opposed environments. Here we have Edinburgh. It's a largely salutogenic city. Salutogenesis is, um, are the attributes of the environment that promote good health. They're health inducing as opposed to pathogens, which are harm inducing and include poor air quality and poor noise quality. So this dichotomy, I've lived in both these places. I, I live in Edinburgh, as I've already said. Um, the other slide is of Bromley by Bow in London, and I've lived in those flats right by that dual carriageway. Um, and this is really the driver of my research. Um, a lot of my research makes use of um, testing people as they walk and move through these environments. So here again, you see that um, dichotomy of streets with no street trees, no greening, and streets with greening. And every single time over, I would say, maybe 10 or 15 studies, we see the same outcomes, that the green street produces mental health outcomes in terms of better stress relief, both in terms of perceived stress and physiological stress, in terms of improved mood, in terms of better cognition and better brain health. And we see that across all sorts of subgroups, including the elderly. I'm going to talk now about two bits of research um, that I generated in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Um, Gail, I don't know if you could give me a quick time check as to how much longer I've got. Uh, but these are the two pieces of work that I think I am really best known for, and they both originated in Scotland. Um, the first um, was work that started in 2013, and it took um, these mobile neural head sensors to explore uh, cortical brain activity the alpha brainwave activity and beta brainwave activity that emits from that cortical brain area as people are moving through different settings. And we walk people through urban parks and we walk them through urban streets. And we found similar patterns across um, various subpopulations. The study here I'm quoting is from 2019. But here you can see just some of the outputs. So if you just take a look at the, um, the, the, the images there on your left-hand side, those are beta, um, beta brainwave activity. Beta is associated with a greater sense of alertness. And you can see that alertness is higher when we're walking in an urban street walk. This is just one person's output. But that is causing depletion of our attention, uh, cognitive um, functioning faculties, whereas the urban park walk is, is much more associated, um, or much less associated, let's say, with that beta. There are different outputs by which we show that. There's a heat map there. It shows the effects of um, alpha wave activity as people are walking through the urban streets, uh, the busy street into the park. And you can see a greater level of intensity of alpha wave activity, which is associated with relaxation in that urban park. So four or five studies now that have been generated. They're quite complex. I can provide links to really lay friendly blogs that will explain some of those processes and outcomes uh, much more simply uh, and effectively than I have time to do today. Um, the other major finding um, and protocol advancement in my research methods is the use of cortisol as a biomarker of stress. 
um, studies that were carried out in deprived parts of Scotland. This particular study was um, carried out in Dundee. If you are regulating cortisol effectively, um, your cortisol, your diurnal cortisol patterns should follow that pattern in the top chart there. So on waking, um, let's say we wake about seven, our cortisol peaks and then it drops off. I don't know if you can follow my course cursor, but your cortisol patterns should drop during the course of a day. And this was the pattern we were looking for. And we focused on people who are experiencing really high levels of stress, people who were unemployed, suffering from economic stresses. And again, you see this dichotomy in environment. Neighborhoods that were matched on a whole host of social demographic variables, but varied on their percentage of green space. So the top diagram there, is an area in Dundee that had 45% plus levels of green space, and the area below had zero or up to 23% level of green space. And what we found controlling for a whole host of variables was that the people in the green space areas, if you can follow my cursor, they had this steeper diurnal cortisol gradient across the day. We did this study over several days and we found similar patterns. Whereas the people who were living with less green space had a flatter cortisol pattern, which is indicative of greater levels of stress burnout. So just two studies from Scotland that have shown the potential um, for green space to impact both our stress but also our sense of relaxation and our levels of alpha wave activity and beta wave activity. So I am going to wrap up very shortly. I'm going to skip over these two studies just to say I've taken the principles from Scotland to Virginia um, and these studies are showing positive changes in cognitive reaction times in those green space locations positive effects on heart rate variability, again, from green space. A tactical urban intervention, looking at shading and improving comfort um, along a waterfront, produce benefits to physiological well-being, to emotional well-being, to social health, and um, increase footfall um, in terms of activity levels. So I'm going to finish there. What I've tried to do very shortly in 15 minutes is convey to you um, the benefits of green and blue cities in terms of mental health and social well-being benefits and how they fit into a wider model that Leila and I are, are um, promoting in terms of what we're calling restorative cities. And I really do believe we are at the moment to reset and restart charge our cities. Um, I think as a public demand um, post COVID for better access to the outdoors for both physical activity, but also for mental health and social recreation. So I'm gonna finish now and pass it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Lim, who uh, is gonna continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Dr. Melissa Lem, and I'm a family physician living and working on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, um, otherwise known as Vancouver, here on the west coast of beautiful Canada. And I'm going to apologize in advance because it's get to school time for my son, so you may see my family Zoom bombing around uh, along this corridor here as I talk. So I ask them to try to be as quiet as possible while I'm while I'm chatting. Um, so Jenny, that was a wonderful introduction on the science behind um, how nature is good for us in cities. And I'm just going to share my presentation here as well. All right, so there is, as you mentioned, an amazing amount of evidence behind the health benefits of nature. And what I see my job is as a health professional and someone who's running a program um, that's trying to connect people to nature is to take that science and put it into action and to socialize this idea within our healthcare profession and within society at large. So I'm going to talk about how we're trying to do that here in Canada. So I want everyone to begin um, by in one word, you can put this in the chat. I know Gil asked us not to put anything in the chat, but it's a moment to, to describe how you feel when you are outside in nature. I'll just give you a moment to, to do that. 
No, please, the, the people in charge here are Melissa and Jenny. So whatever they say is fine. If you wanted to use the chat and, and Melissa, I'm so thankful. I didn't even have time to introduce you, but you can tell them a little bit about yourself and, and, and people are coming up. So fine, use the chat. Uh, sometimes the, the thing is that people use it for more personal things, but when the speaker wants, please, we are honored to have you, both of you here. So Melissa, whatever you want is most welcome. Look at these wonderful words that are coming in. I know, I love seeing the words free, happy, renewed, relaxed. Um, I didn't mention who, you know, what, what I do. So I'm director of park prescriptions for the BC Parks Foundation. And as I mentioned, I'm a family physician um, in Canada. And I'm also, direct, uh, I'm also president elect of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. So bring a strong climate and planetary health lens to the work that I do with the BC Parks Foundation. So I just see these wonderful words like relaxed and calm um, and peaceful, recharged more aware and centered. And so we often run this exercise with people um, and these similar words come up. You can see from, from other um, groups and other presentations we've done, you can see the same word. So calm, peaceful, happy, grounded. And so we have this intuitive sense that when we spend time in nature, we feel better. And all the evidence um, Jenny mentioned, it really shows that it's backed up by science. So you can see from um, better bone density to reduce risk of chronic disease like heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure, to reduce symptoms of ADHD in children, reduced anxiety and depression, better work satisfaction, reduced pain responses after surgery. Spending time in and around nature has a wealth of positive evidence-based effects for our health. And so some people ask, you know, why as a physician you know, why, why don't you um, just work in your office? Why are you advocating for something outside of, of what you do in the healthcare system? And the real reason is, is because healthcare, our healthcare system in Canada is only responsible for about 20 to 25% of our healthcare status. And there's so many other factors making up to 75 to 80% that are much more responsible for our well-being. And if you look at this column in the center here, you can imagine how having access to nature and green space um, can affect many of these different factors and improve our health. So I would really say as healthcare professionals, it's our job to advocate beyond the walls of our hospitals and our offices to make sure that our communities and the patients that we treat are as healthy as possible. And for me, my passion is nature and health. So that's really what I'm I've been focusing on for over a decade. So I'm just going to share some of my favorite studies that had to do with nature and health and, and cities um, that sort of formed the thinking behind our work on nature prescriptions. So this is a study that's made in Canada, a study from Toronto, and it combined high resolution satellite imagery, individual tree data, Ontario health study data, and self reports of health perception. And what it found after controlling for a number of different factors was that an increase of 10 trees per block affected people's health perception similar to an increase in their personal income of $10,000 per year, moving to a neighborhood with $10,000 per year, higher median income, or being seven years younger. Now we know when it comes to health that both income and age are major factors um, when it comes to our health. So I thought it was really interesting how this study brought something very quantifiable, um, such as tree cover or number of trees on a block down to, to factors that we know um, influence our health. This is a study um, that was done in Chicago, and it was a, a study with 17 kids with attention def uh, ADHD, and they guided them on three 20 different 20, three different 20 minute walks through a city park, through a downtown area, and through a residential area. And what they found was that a 20 minute walk in the park actually improved their digit span backwards performance. So this is a test where you just recite a number, uh, a sequence of numbers in a row and get the person to recite them backwards. And the more they can recite, the better their attention and memory. And they found that only the 20 minute of the, a walk in the park improved their DSB performance similar to levels in kids without ADHD. And in fact, when they crunched the numbers, they found that this rivaled the peak effects of Ritalin or a prescription stimulant medication. So no one is saying that a 20 minute walk in the park is going to do everything that, is, that a prescription medication can do. But I think it speaks to really how powerful nature can be as an adjunct to the, the treatments that we often rec traditionally recommend um, in, in our offices. <laughs> Now, as a physician, when someone asks me, okay, you know, write me a prescription, or I think about writing a prescription, I think to myself, okay, like what dose should I write? You know, how, how, how much um, and how often? And in the last 
few years, actually um, recommendations about dose have emerged in the literature. And um, coincidentally, these two papers that I'm going to discuss came out in 2019, just before we launched our nature prescription program in 2020. So this was a study of almost 20,000 adults in England, and they um, asked them to rate their sense of well-being and health. And what they found was when their nature contact was greater than or equal to 120 minutes per week or two hours per week, again, after controlling for a number of different factors that might influence this outcome, um, their likelihood was much higher when they hit two hours per week. And these positive associations continued to accrue, but peaked between about 200 to 300 minutes per week. So, you know, if you're hitting two hours, we're not saying end it there because more nature in general is better. But for the best well-being, we do have a standard recommendation in our program that you spend at least two hours per week in nature. And then how much each time? Um, and this, this kind of complements the work on stress that Jenny um, was talking about. So this was another study released in 2019. And it was a study of 36 urban dwellers over eight weeks looking at cortisol measurements. And they asked them to have a nature experience in an outdoor place that brought them a sense of contact with nature at least three times per week and for 10 minutes or more. And what I found was interesting in this study was they asked them to self-define. So they didn't say, you have to go to this park you know, with no street noise or you have to you know be up on the side of a mountain they said you you self-define it and spend at least this amount of time and so what they found was that their cortisol or primary stress hormone levels dropped over 20 percent more after a nature experience combined to a non-nature one and that efficacy or the the um rapidity of how quickly that cortisol dropped was greatest between the 20 and 30 minute mark so a lot of us are very busy people we live in cities we have a lot on our plates um so if you're thinking about getting the most bang for your buck in terms of your nature experience, try to aim for, you know, that between that 20 and 30 minute level. But of course, you can spend more time in nature if you're inspired to do so. All right, so I also want to talk about why health is such an effective message and why the BC Parks Foundation has chosen to fund and work on a nature prescription program when it is uh, more of a charity. It's the official charitable partner to BC Parks that's focused on conservation and nature spaces. And it's because health is such an effective message for getting people to support policy change. So we can take some of these lessons from climate change research. There was a really interesting study released just last year um, that did surveys, surveys with over 7,500 participants in five countries across the world. And they read the participants or they asked the participants to read five pairs of statements and ask them which of the two would make them more likely to support policies tackling climate change. And so this was health and environmental, economic and migration framing. And also they asked them to take kind of a, uh, op they used opportunity framing or threat framing, uh, meaning these are all the great things that will happen if you do this versus these are all the awful things that will happen if, if we don't. Um, and so what they found was that when they framed these policy statements in terms of benefits for health, that health and environmental framing increased support. And among people who weren't concerned about climate change at all, health was actually the only framing that increased support um, for these policy proposals. Economic framing, which we often hear from government and industry, had no effect on the average person when it came to convincing them to support policy change. Um, opportunity or positive framing increased support more than negative framing. And also focusing on the present positive impacts were more, or the present impacts of climate change, positive or negative, were more motivating than future impacts. So that's really what we try to do in our program is we focus on the current health impacts and opportunities that nature gives us when we talk about, when we uh, devise our messaging. And it's because this is really more motivating to change people's behavior. So connecting to nature is good for the planet, not only for ourselves, but also for the planet. So healthcare is a major contributor to global carbon emissions. And in fact, if global healthcare were a country, it would be the fifth highest emitter in the world. So anything that improves our health status, reduces demand on our healthcare system is going to reduce carbon emissions and slow down global heating. Also, there were many um, studies and a lot of evidence and frameworks that Jenny mentioned around how urban nature makes cities healthier, not only for us as humans, but also having green spaces and tree cover in our cities improves their, uh, struck their health from an infrastructure, from a heat, from a pollution perspective as well, which I'll get into a little more in the next slide. Also, children who have more nature experiences are more likely to become adult environmentalists and adults who are more connected to nature are more likely to protect it. So the thing is, it totally makes sense that people who are more connected to nature, who fall in love with nature in their, in their communities, are more likely to protect what they love. 
but also people who are more connected to nature are more likely to engage in other pro-environmental behaviors like uh, recycling, like conserving energy, like voting for or engaging in climate action. And so I like to think that um, when we write nature prescriptions, whether it's one of this, the 7,000 colleagues I have across Canada who are now registered to prescribe nature, and this actually represents um, over 5% of all practicing physicians in Canada after only a year and a half of having our program in place, which I think is incredible. Anyway, I like to think that we're building a movement to get people to love um, and conserve nature and also engage in climate action on a, on a wider level. We also know that Inger Anderson, the executive director of the UN Environment Program has said that nature is one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and should be part of every country's climate strategy. So it's been estimated that if we fully embrace nature-based solutions for climate change around the world, which focus on restoring and expanding nature while dealing with human and societal issues, that this could get us over a third of the way towards our 2030 Paris Agreement targets. Right now around the world, maybe about 5% of overall investments, um, government investments are in nature-based solutions for climate change. Um, when it comes to overall investments in climate change, it makes up such a tiny piece of the pie. And so, you know, if we can engage our trusted health voice and advocate for, for more nature in our cities, for more of these nature-based solutions for climate change, I think we really have a chance at closing that gap between the five and the, and the 30%. All right, so just a quick slide about um, the benefits that we see in nature of, to, you know, of tree cover and of green spaces. So this is a map of a heat map of what happened during the heat dome in June of 2021 that killed almost um, close to 600 people within the space of a couple weeks. And what you can see is that here in the downtown east side, which is one of the most economically deprived areas um, of, of our city, is where 70% of hospitalizations came um, in Vancouver Coastal Health and our health authority during the heat dome. And when researchers have looked at the different factors that led to people dying during the heat dome, that, that included being elderly, being isolated, and also having relatively lower tree cover and green space because you know, those, those areas were physically hotter and less safe. Um, so this is another reason why it's so important for us to have green spaces and tree cover in cities because it's an equity issue. So when you, er when you green urban areas, this reduces the need for air conditioning because of shade. It lowers energy demand, which lowers air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. It removes air pollutants, um, depending on the kind of tree and tree cover. It sequesters carbon dioxide. It reduces stormwater runoff and improves water quality. And it's been estimated that every $1 invested in an urban tree returns up to $3 in benefits. So again, Again, this is this is even though you know I like to talk in terms of health framing um, at convincing people really there is a great economic argument at, for greening our cities and in, increasing tree cover. So we were really proud um, that our program was recognized at COP26 as a way to inspire restoration and protection of nature as the foundation of our health. And I think this was really the start of the world recognizing um, our Made in Canada program and how important. Uh, you know, nature prescribing is, is for our health. I know we're really proud to, um, I'm really thankful to know our colleagues in the US, for example, with Parker X America and at the Golden Gate Institute, the amazing work that they're, they're doing on nature and health. But this was the first time that the, the WHO actually recognized nature prescribing as, as essential, as good for our health. Um, so we we're very proud of that. And so this is our website, if you're interested in learning more um, we're at parkprescriptions.ca and there are lots of practical resources that you can find there and information about how good nature is for our health. If you're a licensed healthcare professional within Canada, you can sign up to prescribe nature for our program and join the close to 7,000 um, prescribers that we have now. And you'll, on our website, you can see under the prescriber section, um, 14 different fact sheets broken down by health issue and adult and children talking about the, the health benefits, the evidence proven health benefits behind nature and how to maximize your nature prescription when you do get it. And this is just a nod, um, a thank you to Parks Canada, who at the end of uh, January, we announced a collaboration where our prescribers can now prescribe um, free Parks Canada discovery passes to our patients to reduce one barrier to access to nature, which is the cost of accessing nature. Um, and we're also, the BC Parks Foundation has also been meeting with different transportation organizations um, because transportation has been identified as one major barrier to nature access to see how we can get people who live in relatively deprived nature areas of the city 
to those nature rich areas at least you know once a week or a few times a week to experience those health benefits. So I believe that's my last slide. Oh, actually, no, this is my last slide. So um, in terms of some takeaways, what I'd like people to remember is to spend at least two hours in nature each week and at least 20 minutes each time to maximize your health benefits. Spread the word to health professionals about nature prescribing. And if you're in Canada, our, our program, um, PARX. And if you're in Canada, something we're also trying to do is not just improve access to national parks um, and uh, you know, national marine conservation areas through Parks Canada, but we also have partnerships with, for example, um, the University of British Columbia Botanical Gardens or Natobe Gardens on Vancouver Island with Milner Gardens. Um, and basically we're trying to allow people who live in cities who don't necessarily live in proximity to national parks to also have reduced barriers to nature access. So you can have free admission or discounted admission to these urban based uh, nature venues. So we're trying to build those partnerships. And if you, you know a nature based organization or venue within Canada, connect us and then also so um, donating to the BC Parks Foundation to support our work or other charities that seek to connect people to nature is a great way to also reduce those barriers for people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, night, wherever you are. Thank you.